Good morning. Here we are on another Sunday show, and today's guest is Dr. Etienne Cap um, Calabou. Um, we're, it's very simple what we do is we are trying to provide tips and information to people touched by cancer so they can increase their personal odds of survival. Nothing more, nothing less. So, Dr. Etienne Calabou, how are you this morning? I'm all right, thank you. Probably colder here than where you are. Yeah, I think we're at 32 <laughs> degrees today, but it's been a bit cloudy. I mean, I should complain. But fortunately, we don't have too much COVID. Okay. So how's COVID in your part of the world? Very good? Well, it seems to be getting better, but uh, you never know with COVID. It has always surprises. That's right. This could be another strain next week. Um, right, we're going to, as usual, I've got readers' questions here. Uh, they're your right. questions I'm going to be asking of Etienne, but um, the first one's from me. Very simply, I first met you something like 16 years ago. And I brought Catherine, my daughter, who was grade four brain tumor then, to see you. And you sent us off to Harley Street for a blood test. And then you wrote us something like 23 pages. We received them when we were in the south of France. 23 pages on the supplements she should be taking. I think it was something like 60. Is that your normal modus operandi or is that kind of um, just an unusual case? Well, no, in the sense that uh, now we have much more sophisticated tests uh, than the ones we had then. Um, we have tests that uh, uh, have algorithms attached to it so that we can know what is more important, what is less important, and uh, so that we only have to uh, correct the most important ones and the rest can be hopefully corrected on its own because the body is not a robot. Yeah. And then you must be careful not to overwhelm people. At the same time, I have to have in mind that a fragile equilibrium, a sort of pathological balance has been established and in correcting certain things it might be that i break that pathological balance and then i make things worse than they were before um so i'm standing with that what do i do what don't i do the result being that unlike the perception of some people i actually prescribe less uh in view of the amount of days that uh, everything is prescribed. Uh, sometimes the uh, prescription of uh, what you mentioned, a lot of supplements, is only 12 days a month uh, mm -hmm. or less because of the alternation. Um, because uh, I noticed over the years that I, number one, that I have to alternate uh, procedures or supplements, uh, sometimes exaggerate. Uh, that is called hormesis, which you can call talk maybe later on. And uh, because cancer uh, dates from 3 million years ago or whatever, when we were unicellular beings and they had to fend for themselves. And one of the ways they fend for themselves is mutations. So they can change all the time and they still do that. So having that in mind, uh, if you do too much of the same, uh, even with the tests that we do, then uh, uh, you can end up again with a changed cancer uh, at that time. Uh, that's why we have estrogen positive that becomes estrogen negative or uh, have another mutation. Sometimes they go back to the primary tumor. So you have different strands uh, with uh, cancer stem cells in the same tumor or further on. So um, we have this. Uh, and what I do now as tests as well is the, CIA, IA, which is basically, uh, if you have, for example, an exam, and you know the exam questions, I'm talking about students here, in advance, then it's much easier to go back. And that is a sort of test where we look at the proteins in uh, and a classification of proteins uh, in people. And uh, we look at a sort of V-like shaped curve. We know the standard deviation and when it's out of the standard deviation, we have to look at that. And then we know already in advance what protein has been secreted, 
because the gene can secrete God knows how many proteins depending on the input from uh, whether it's bacteria, viruses, your own, your own genetic material, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we know that now with Bruce Lipton and uh, the change of um, genetic expressions and et cetera. So that we know, and not when you are born, but now at this very moment, when we take the blood test, what we can do. So in that way, the blood tests have changed a lot since um, I did the uh, test uh, 15 years ago. It's much more sophisticated and in a, some odd way, um, uh, more simple, but more intense, even though it doesn't look like that, uh, yeah. there's work to do. Um, and uh, yeah, the other, I wouldn't say is a problem, uh, but um, uh, in the past, people were generally using uh, chemotherapy and uh, maybe operation, maybe radiation, uh, maybe some hormonal, anti-hormonal type of treatments. But now you have this whole range of um, uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, small molecules, etc. And some of them, especially the tyrosine kinase um, uh, ones, um, have an enormous amount of interactions and side effects so that uh, you have to take that into account as well. So that's the difference. With, uh, when I kept getting asked questions by people who wrote in about measuring deficiencies, you're much more than just deficiencies, you're much more into imbalances. And so what I take yeah. out of what you're saying is that the trouble with imbalances is in correcting three of the seven imbalances, you could actually introduce an eighth imbalance. You, you gotta be very careful. That's right, that's what I'm saying and trying to say uh, exactly that. Um, and, uh, you know, just like some people, you don't want to correct a spinal posture or whatever it is, because if you correct that uh, surgically, uh, you will create a, a side effect on the hips or the knees or whatever you have. You better let it be how it is. So does this mean you have to work on an ongoing basis with patients? I mean, I, I always do do what I do and then say, please, please come back in about 15 weeks because I want to see what we've done and see what, what we really can, how we can polish you. Do you do the same sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if they come back, we have to see how they are. Uh, some of these blood tests can be expensive, so I cannot always redo the blood test, but they have the blood test from the hospital uh, or progress or scans from the hospital, and uh, then we can uh, make an overall balance. But if we need another blood test, yeah, then uh, that is done, obviously, uh, so that uh, you can reevaluate and see how far you go or not go. So tell me, this is really in two parts. Do you get people who just come to you for alternative therapies? As a, so you, know, you're, you alone are dealing with them or, or do you get people who come to you and they're on chemo or drugs or tyrosine kinase inhibitors and so on and you are trying to build a program around them? And that was a, a question from um, um, Sally Roberts, I think. Uh, I, the question if people come along, um, um, since uh, uh, what they call in England, um, good practice, yes. uh, it's possible to do that uh, because everybody needs to have their um, oncologist. So every doctor follows uh, the good practice guide um, has been modified Blair Brown uh, at that point, since uh, he had that illustrious Mr. Shipman, uh, etc., cetera. Um, and then they changed all the laws for the protection of the patients. That means that uh, anybody who wants to do uh, cancer therapies uh, on their own, and they see a medical doctor, that medical doctor in the UK uh, cannot do that. Otherwise he might well lose his license. Uh, and that is the policy. So uh, I cannot really answer that question as such. What does happen uh, is that some people uh, have been given up uh, and they can't do anything anymore. In that case, uh, you, you can see what you can do, cannot do. Having said that, uh, the new therapies uh, that are coming out 
seem to be much better than what I've seen in the last 30 years uh, as such, uh, objectively speaking. So I don't like this um, way that alternative medicine and uh, hospital medicine are seen as polarities that are opposed to each other. So I much evolved uh, compared to 30 years ago uh, in that sense. Um, and the strange thing is that the people who are most open to this uh, is basically the professors. I have uh, uh, five professors, which I have a good relationship with, but once you go under professor, I don't understand why. I still wonder. Um, uh, they seem to be more radically approached, uh, more radically opposed to this cooperation. And it's a question of leaving your ego at the door, picking it up obviously when you go out, but uh, when you see someone uh, to do as you should do, uh, as far as I'm concerned, what is the best? And this cooperation uh, is much better now. Don't forget that uh, up until very recently, um, five years, 10 years ago, there were still many oncologists who said, immune system have nothing to do, believe it or not, yeah. uh, with, um, uh, with uh, uh, cancer. And uh, I know of one person uh, who actually arrived at the GMC who had to be defended because uh, he said something about cancer and immunotherapy 10 years ago or something. Um, and, uh, you know, now we have uh, immunotherapies. But that's the big difference between Britain and America. I, I deal with people in Britain. I deal with quite a lot of people in America. And in America, immunotherapy is for the immune system. In Britain, I get a lot of people who, whose oncologist just thinks that an immunotherapy drug is another drug. So they use it, you know, carboplatin and taxol and avastin, and immediately they run straight into an immunotherapy which has to be wrong, surely, it has to be wrong. In America, they give you three months to recover and build your T cells and things like that. Do you find the same? Yeah, uh, I'm gonna be very careful what I say or not say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, we live in England and uh, since these laws are out, uh, uh, every doctor has to follow. Uh, you know, if you're not a doctor, you can say things and uh, no one takes notice, but uh, um, you might have. Well, I think my yeah. point, you, I'm sure you can answer this is when we talk about people coming to you, do they do the majority of people come to you and then at some point they must change their drugs? Surely that affects the imbalances when as soon as someone takes a drug, for good or for bad, you've got a new imbalance on your hands or yes. new yeah. imbalances on your hands, haven't you? Absolutely. That's why when the labs say, I mean, that's a personal approach that I do, I never say to stop what they're taking because that's okay. what they are now. And when they do the test, if I ask them, uh, well, will you stop next week with this drug or is it a permanent ongoing thing that you do? And if it's a permanent ongoing thing or for the next six months or whatever, then I say, no, don't stop anything. We just do the test as you are now. Uh, and uh, that's what I do uh, because there's no point of testing someone. It's like testing someone for the thyroid, telling him to stop his thyroid medication for one week and then do it, you know. No, I agree. Uh, I agree. I never tell anybody to stop doing what they're doing. If the doctor's recommending something, that's it. My... I just help build programs around the doctor's clever stuff is what I say time and time again. So what, what are the most common imbalances that you find? If you had to say what the top three or four Im common imbalances uh, were. Well, very often the thyroid is not right. Uh, many people have Hashimoto without knowing they had Hashimoto, yeah. even though they are underactive. Uh, I see that uh, uh, quite a lot happening. Uh, that goes with it. Uh, uh, to be more specific, I see uh, uh, many people have a, uh, a gamma tocopherol uh, uh, um, uh, reduction and uh, uh, a vitamin E specific. 
that I see abnormally a lot. And obviously the insulin resistance is a very common one. Yeah. And many people don't even know uh, they have a, a higher hemoglobin A1C and you know, these are all the details, but uh, they, they, they actually don't realize the, that they have these uh, uh, problems as such. Uh, I mean, if, uh, you have the hormonal imbalances, but usually when the people come and see me, they already own some drugs or anti-hormonal drugs. If that was, a, you know, with breast cancer patients, for example, etc. So if you ask me what are the most common one, uh, it's very difficult to say. Uh, uh, you look first at all the hormones, you look at... Uh, Let me just the... ask you about the thyroid, because... Um, I once wrote an article about um, levothyroxine because I had three ladies in about four days who all were on levothyroxine and they'd all got breast cancer. And to cut a long story short, I wrote this article because I found lots of research on levothyroxine and how it could prompt breast cancer. And um, I wrote an article and I got six nurses in Britain saying great article, but I got two doctors quite separately in America saying you don't know what you're talking about. And the reason was they said 95% of people who actually come to them with thyroid problems quite simply are low in iodine. And they only ever have to give levothyroxine to 5% of people. Would you agree with that or not? Well, there's another way of thinking of it. I tried to remember his name and I've got the papers, uh, but um, there is one guy who uh, wrote his article, he's a professor in America, and he was basically saying that the T4, which is the, what you say, um, uh, is actually pro-cancer, and the T3 is anti-cancer. Mm. And he treated people, instead of with T4, uh, with T3. And then uh, there was an improvement uh, in the cancer situation, and you have people who treat like that. So yeah. uh, uh, I know iodine is necessary uh, for having the transformation, I think, of uh, estradiol in estriol. That means basically uh, of a more proactive or more pro-growth uh, hormone in a not so pro-growth hormone, which is estriol. And you need to probably, uh, I mean, it was in the, in, the, in the papers that I saw, a need for iodine. So, uh, but iodine, uh, lack of iodine is actually more in the third world or, uh, and uh, the underactive thyroids in our regions seem to be much more of an autoimmune nature, which is yes. linked to the gut and uh, all the rest that goes with it with an overactive immune system uh, in the gut that then uh, starts to attack your thyroid uh, or anywhere in your body that uh, it might, uh, an autoimmune disease can attack. Uh, well, Hashimoto's so is linked to SIBO um, and small intestine and, and, and autoimmune disease. How do you deal with SIBO? Because I, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a classic, I get quite a few people with Hashimoto's and, um, right. you know, everywhere you look, I mean, it's not, you can't just give them a probiotic because it's not that's not the issue. The issue is the gut bacteria are in the wrong place. It's not that they, ha right. <laughs> they haven't got any. They've, it's in the, they're in the wrong place. How do you deal with SIBO? Well, that's a big issue in the sense that, first of all, um, there's this Gundry. He has a little, uh, I don't know always what he claims, etc. But as far as I'm concerned, every being on this earth from the smallest microbe to the biggest one, uh, whether it's plants or whether it's animals, whatever, uh, doesn't want to be eaten and needs to eat to survive or kill to survive. I don't know, no exceptions. Whether you're vegan or vegetarian, you kill the plants and that's it. And the plant doesn't want to be killed because it has substances in it uh, from lectins and saponins and chaconins and poisons and uh, uh, it sticks the lectins out for the insects that wants to eat it, you name it. In other words, we need to neutralize these things, but some of these things in the plants um, affect our uh, resistance. And also the stresses we are under, uh, obviously vagus nerve, etc., uh, affect uh, the gut as well. 
plus all the poisons that we eat and all the chemicals and all you name it, uh, that's all over. So we get a leaky gut. So the, there are supplements like uh, uh, lectin uh, control formula, but they have others as well for the gut, not eating it. And you have a, a new microbiome that is needed. Uh, in other words, you need to take a, a certain, um, uh, what we call prebiotics, you either as food, but initially in the form of powder and uh, certain uh, 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 bacteria uh, of the good nature, because the bacteria are a bit like humanity. You have some good ones, some bad ones, and many, many opportunistic ones. And you have to have the good. It's just like a, a symbol almost of our society, you know, a dictator, the whole country is a dictator. The dictator dies like Franco in, in Spain. All of a sudden, we have a democracy. Uh, you know, uh, that's the same thing. Uh, like everywhere, the same thing happens in our gut. Uh, we have to feed it. We have the importance of butyric acid, uh, small chain fatty acid uh, that is secreted by a, a good bacteria. Uh, 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 that's an important factor. That seems to be a common factor in all the people who live in the blue zones. Uh, whatever they diet, that they have an excellent microbiome, uh, whatever they say, you know, I'm 100 years because uh, I'm teetotal, I'm 100 years because I drink a brandy Alexander every morning, whatever. But uh, uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. They have a good microbiome. They have a, a, a detoxification system of someone 50 years younger. Uh, they uh, have never stopped working. Uh, they have always given, for some reason, if you give people unconditionally things, uh, it seems to be important for the immune system, uh, and they have a, a rich inner life, whether it's spiritual or philosophical or whatever, and outer as well. So all these factors, I, I tend to say, have a direct effect, the mind as well, and the emotions on uh, the Vegas. You only have to look at the student or uh, at someone else who is scared. Scared uh, has an effect uh, a stress on, on the gut. Uh, so that is interlinked and has to be looked at. So we, we look at the permeability, we look at the microbiome, we, we, we look at the, the foods that come in, uh, we look at the mind, uh, the vagus nerve, and uh, once that is restored, then your 60% of your immune system, more or less, that's in the gut, can finally lock down. That's also the reason why you say to people not to eat three to four hours before they go to bed, if they're not diabetic, uh, because then uh, the gut can rest and, yep. uh, and you know, and then uh, the body can eliminate and then the immune system can be, instead of digesting food, can be busy uh, fighting cancers, can be busy uh, fighting infections, detoxification, etc. a few hours more every night. Uh, you know, as I said to other people sometimes, you can eat a very healthy diet, but if you graze the whole day and you eat your big meal five minutes before you go to bed, you're probably worse off than yep. someone in uh, an average English diet, uh, let's say, but stops eating at six o'clock, starts eating at, uh, let's say, 11 o'clock or uh, 10 o'clock, uh, has his main meal more at lunchtime or his protein, because that's the most difficult to digest, like they did when I was younger, you know, that's what they did. Uh, you know. I, I've, always, I've had a house in the south of France for a long, long time, and I've always said I much prefer lunch to dinner. I much prefer lunch to dinner. And what I was watching a programme on the BBC about the Blue Zone, and what was really interesting was, and they were talking to a lady who was 101, and another guy who was 99, and so on, is the, 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 the first of all, they weren't thin. Secondly, they actually got up in the morning and did their job. So they put their sheep out, their goats out, whatever, and didn't eat till about 10 o'clock. And they had their last meal of the day at half past five. So hmm. they were doing time restricted fasting, you know, this yeah. great new trendy thing. Anyway, that's what they were doing. And, yeah. and, and one lady, she was 101, and they said, what's the secret? That was her birthday that day. They said, what's the secret? And she said, I walk down to the village uh, every day, and I have two fingers of red wine, and then I walk back again. And what I took <laughs> out of that was actually much more what she did in the village, which was she sat round, and she was part of about 10 people all sitting there laughing, and they were all really healthy. She was part of a community, which is exactly the word you mm. use. 
And I, I, I think that that's the whole thing about the rainbow diet. To me, there's, it's a lifestyle diet. It's not just about food. You, yeah. you, know, you, you, you mentioned about six things. Let me pick up on a couple of them. Do you think there are bugs? We're always told there are bacteria. Everybody gets cancers, lost bacteria, and they've lost strains of bacteria and so on. But do you think it works the other way around? Do you think there are bacteria they are going to discover that actually correct cancer? You can actually oh, well, keep those people back these bacteria that will correct cancer. Well, there is this uh, eccentric professor. I think he's retired now from uh, Florida's Firenze, uh, Professor Ruggiero. Um, uh, he has his eccentricities, but uh, he put these bacteria together, and uh, uh, he put samples already out there so that he can use these bacteria that are mainly anti-cancerous. So uh, I think that a lot of work has been done, just like uh, they have been looking at people with pancreatic cancer. I know, don't know the outcome of the study, but they did bit unusual survivors of uh, pancreatic cancer. They found bacteria, specific bacteria in those cancers. And what they have done are fecal transplants uh, uh, to other people uh, uh, with pancreatic cancer, obviously, and we are waiting uh, what's the result. So it's all in its infancy, but I'm pretty sure that, I mean, I can't tell, but uh, that uh, they already have some of these bacteria, but uh, we still have to find, uh, and they have names I never heard of, actually, uh, when I read it. <laughs> you know. people, people do these these microbiome tests and they send it to me and you get these names you've never heard of and you know they're not in a supplement so i never know quite what to say to these people you know how am i going to give you a replacement for these bugs you've lost do you find that's a problem uh yeah so i can only say we must uh do make the conditions as such that these bacteria uh, are mainly uh there and uh, are encouraged uh, just like, uh, and if people don't want to follow diets, well, uh, you do like the Italians, uh, they have a, they're thinner than the rest of the world, even though they eat all this spaghetti and pasta, then they realize it's because of the minestrone soup, there's a bolotto bean into that, that blocks the amylase, uh, in the same way green beans do that. So I say, mm, eat green beans, or you could say, uh, you eat resistant starch, uh, uh, etc. So that in the end, uh, your good bacteria will eat those things and they have to go to the toilet somewhere. So they do it in your gut and they get um, out comes butyric acid. And that butyric acid uh, will uh, heal the gut, but it's also a signaling molecule uh, so that it makes you better against cancer. So you can trick yourself away with that as well. And what is often forgotten by the blue zones as well, I remember being in Crete quite a while ago, but uh, the older men, only older men and older women I've seen, they climb up and get all these uh, wild herbs. And I think one of the things that I missed with these blue zones, I, I haven't had time to investigate is, but you know, uh, whether it's on the Greek island, the Karyos, or whether it's the, the sheep eating, uh, uh, herbs with artemisinin, or what is everywhere, they seem to have uh, uh, concentrated uh, packets of uh, food in the form of herbs. And I think someone should make uh, a study of the type of herbs that are used and how many they use and fresh uh, in the so-called blue zones. So uh, that's an interesting thought. I think that's herbs are very, very important. But you hit you you said butyric acid. I this this is my theory at the moment that they you have this whole range of good bacteria and they make everything from your B vitamins to vitamin K and so on. But you have these super bacteria. You have like three lots of ninety. We don't know how many it is yet. One lot make propionate, one lot make acetate, and one lot make butyrate. And it seems to me that butyrate is the king of the jungle. It, I mean, I, I did some research this morning. I wrote an article for next week about neurodegenerative uh, diseases. So it was Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and things like this. And lo and behold, it's a bunch of bacteria they found all make butyrate that actually can put this thing straight. 
Okay, well, I didn't know that, but again, you know, many roads, but lead to the same sort of things. Yeah. Uh, way. Uh, so yeah. Um, so as they say. So you try- attempt to build a microbiome in your patients, do you? Oh yeah, it's very important, especially in the last five years when all these things have been found. When you read about when a baby goes through the alpha pro bacteria. They piggyback on a macrophage, they go into your brain, they communicate with their uh, uh, grandchildren, if you want to say, in uh, uh, in that time with uh, via uh, light, basically. Uh, uh, but then we're not talking about science fiction here, we're talking about effectively. So if they can do that uh, for the good or better or the worse, and uh, these bacteria, communicate uh, like your mitochondria, communicate with the ancestors in the form of bacteria that came through. Uh, well, yep. what else can you do? Uh, what's gonna happen here? Uh, so, uh, you know, again, and that's why I more and more seem to evolving, but it's very difficult. You talked uh, about uh, the use of supplements. I'm talking, how can you in the most consistent way use energetically um, uh, all these, uh, uh, giving all these facts that we have, but uh, I can't see how we can make a, a coherent coherent uh, type of way of using it, but uh, it's definitely a step higher on the pyramid uh, where you can see all these flowing of energy, acupuncture does it to a certain extent with uh, Dr. Tennant there, uh, work further on that with the teeth and uh, you know etc but it's such a complex system but it shouldn't be complex i'm sure when one day <laughs> it would be found how to use these systems it wouldn't be not so complicated and so that you combine the pulse electromagnetic magnetic frequencies at the right moment at the right time uh, when you give things etc uh, so in that way, uh, I think progress has to be made, but since we don't know it yet entirely how it all works, I have to fall back on, um, you know, the, 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 the food and the yeah. uh, supplement, etc. I was talking to Professor Dana Flavin about this, and she's very big on energy, and, and she's been talking to lots of people about energies, but you're absolutely right, she, she knew certain energies but she said it's a big subject and we're not there yet so i agree do you do you have um do you have a, a favorite diet or is it horses for courses with you a favorite diet diet well first of all you have this um uh what's her name uh, ruth kelly i think dr ruth kelly radical remission and radical hope where she saw that the six out of the ten uh, there were initially nine and there were about 10 uh, conditions whereby uh, people with a stage four cancer got better. And the first thing is the common factor between all the diets seems to be half of your plate with vegetables that grow above the ground. That's one. Um, and uh, when you say this to people, that makes it much easier. Uh, yes, uh, I have particular diets. It can very. I've been inspired a long time ago already in the 80s by the metabolic typing from um, uh, Kelly, uh, Dr. Kelly, a dentist, and then Gonzalez uh, was further on, but they were always very cagey about they actually worked or not. When it came to the nitty gritty, I never got out of Gonzalez what he actually was doing and not doing, but that's beside the point. But they made at least that distinction uh, between what to eat, uh, you know, Gonzalez, for example, would say, oh, the solid cancers, uh, you have more uh, vegetarian, vegan type of diet, and the non-solid cancers, uh, you have a more meat and uh, potato diet, but that was very generalized, uh, how they come about with this thing. I think the most important thing is what I said earlier, eat less than you normally should eat, and what the Japanese or in Okinawa, they have a Japanese word, it, I forget it now, uh, but it means uh, uh, haka, hishi, whatever it's called, but that you eat only 80% till you're full. Uh, 
uh, that sort of thing. And then the circadian rhythm that I just described. And um, uh, I generally uh, don't like the grain so much. And uh, I have a tendency to agree with Gundry that if you eat too much of these uh, foods that have been introduced to, the, to Europe, for example, 500 years ago, coming from the Americas, our systems are not. So I always say, um, well, more or less, um, how did your ancestors eat in periods where there was uh, no famine and no war, which is rare, but uh, you can ask about the vegetables, uh, like you cannot give an Eskimo as far, or a First Nation, whatever, uh, in the North Pole, uh, the same food as someone from uh, uh, Congo, uh, who's been born and bred there, and uh, who, who lives there since thousands of years, uh, and give him an Eskimo, uh, give him a diet of blubber and fish, and they won't survive. Uh, that doesn't work, uh, and vice versa. Uh, so you have to take that into account. So uh, organic, uh, circadian rhythms, uh, uh, vegetables that grow above the ground, uh, reduce your grains uh, or something altogether. The problem is, for example, with wheat that has been genetically engineered for 100 years and now modified for no, no, 10, 10 years. So if I read uh, yeah, that your sugar can go up higher than pure sugar, if you eat the wheat from now, uh, we have basically uh, massacred everything around us. So um, I would go back to a more of a hunter gatherer, but you must be careful with that as well. Uh, and so on. Uh, you can use water, but you can use EZ water, um, and uh, uh, whereby your water becomes uh, H3O2 minus, uh, so that uh, you have that tension. You can see on YouTube that uh, pathogens cannot uh, penetrate this sort of a uh, wall of uh, uh, invisible wall of electro tension that goes with it, uh, etc. Uh, uh, I mean, it's too diverse. I, I to agree. I, I mean, I use the rainbow diet. I use the Mediterranean diet. I, I wrote it in my brain. It was written long before I ever got near cancer because I learned my French near Toulouse, just south of Toulouse. And right. this, this is the epicenter of the French paradox. So it was always, and I've lived in the Mediterranean for years, it was always the, the, the Mediterranean diet meets the French paradox for me. And uh, so I'm, I'm quite into good fats and things like that. But I vary according to the patient because, um, you know, different cancers need different uh, strokes, I think. And secondly, usually I'm using the diet to boost the microbiome. And we've got brilliant research. It's just come out. I don't know whether you know, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And they looked at what foods prompted what bacteria. So it was, it right. was, it was from Holland. And it, it, certain foods prompted right. ba bacteria right. that made inflammatory molecules and certain foods prompted bacteria that made anti-inflammatory molecules and so on. And lo and behold, it's the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet, all the foods in the Mediterranean diet were the ones that made anti-inflammatory molecules. There was even a great line in it. It was talking about um, alcohol and it said, alcohol by and large makes inflammatory molecules, uh, bacteria that make inflammatory molecules, except for one, red wine. And it said it made anti-inflammatory molecules. So I think there was a big tick for the red wine drinkers. Well, there's another one about the French champagne. Uh, is that oh, the don't tell me. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Germans look at a whole range of wine, and for two years they tried to grow cancer cells on uh, French champagne, and they couldn't do it. Apart from that, in the champagne region, you have orthophosphoric acid in the soil, ATP, but most importantly, because of the fermentation inside the bottles, uh, 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 every food or uh, that the cancer could live on seem to have been destroyed. And in Germany, there's even a cancer center where they give one or two flutes of champagne mid morning, uh, <laughs> European style. Uh, you know, <laughs> that's what they my do. My patients are queuing up to that. My, my best friend, I have to say, lives in Reims and he is enormous okay. and he got COVID and he's 76 and he's basically shrugged it off. I was very, very surprised. I must say, I was very worried about him, but he's a champagne broker. So uh, there you go. So perhaps, perhaps, there, 
Perhaps there is something in all this. He certainly drinks well, more than two glasses of champagne a day, I can tell you. Yeah, um, but look look at the blue zones. You, you have them, they all drink uh, wine or sake or whatever, except your Malinda, which is absolutely. seven days at this. So, and regarding the red wine, uh, an, an English professor wrote his interesting book, uh, interesting job too, to do that, where he looked at all the wines with the most uh, polyphenols, etc., yeah. and uh, made a whole list of that. So uh, uh, we have that as well. So, uh, and as you know, the people in the blue zones drink more on average, uh, uh, like half a liter of red wine, which is locally made and uh, which they eat with their drink with their food. Uh, so uh, to have I, all these strict rules. I should just say uh, for our, our viewers, who don't know what a blue zone is. There are five blue zones in the world. And the big one in Europe is Sardinia, and it has more 80, 90, and 100 year olds than anywhere else in the whole world, including in Japan and so on. But there are five blue zones. And that's what we're really talking about. We're talking about longevity. But I mean, these people in the blue zone have got all their marbles. That's the first thing. And yeah. they don't walk with sticks or anything. They're highly, highly um, young. I mean, if you see what I mean. And it's quite remarkable. Tell me, what do you think about the ketogenic diet? Because I get so many people come to me and they're sort of, they've tried the ketogenic diet and they can't do it. What do you think about it? Well, as I said before, uh, you have hormesis and you have alternating. And um, as far as I'm concerned, um, it is no good to be on a ketogenic diet as well uh, all the time like any type uh, as such, because the ketone bodies formed in the liver um, will, at some point, there's certain cancers who live on ketones. I know a cancer can adapt all the time and to be continuously on a ketogenic diet, uh, apart maybe for some brain cancers, uh, but a lot of study have to be done with it. I'm against every, diet that is taken permanently because the body will react just like if you continuously on a low insulin diet your liver will say ah oh, we don't want that cybernetics like a thermostat too high it goes down too low it goes up it secretes glucose from a protein called neoglucogenesis and then oh usual the body overshoots as usual just like when the bee stings you in the throat then uh, the body says, ah, toxins, let's dilute it. It kills you, uh, you know, because you don't have air anymore. And then they have noticed that if people, for example, over the weekend, healthy people um, uh, eat much more relaxed, that after six weeks, the average of glucose level actually is lower than the people who That's use uh, that. So my same comment about ketogenic diet, like everything with the body, you need alternating. The same thing with this hyperbaric oxygen, you know. Well, if you find whales uh, who in uh, harpooning them from 1790 or something, and they're still alive, uh, can we not alternate hyperbaric and hypoxia or anything like that? It says if you have to shake the body all the time uh, in some way or another, and these alternations give some sort of uh, positive stress uh, to us, uh, and the voltage too. Uh, why is it that the heart hardly gets uh, cancer? Uh, the small intestine, the jejunum, it might be due to the excess uh, 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 enzymes uh, when you're in the womb, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, uh, the the tension of, of the membrane of the heart cell is about minus 120 millivolt. It's minus 70 or 80 uh, for a normal cell plus 30 for a cancer cell. Uh, so, uh, uh, what is happening there? Can we work with that? Can we alternate? Can we see? But uh, basically, I'm saying mono meaning all the time the same thing. The cancer will guarantee it, adapt to it uh, in some way or another. Uh, and I think that's what's happening. And that uh, uh, answer would be for every cancer. I, I'm sure that if you eat food, close to nature. I often used to say fruitcakes don't grow on trees. Um, but, uh, you know, 
uh, he can have it on Sunday. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, you have to think, okay, how you eat, uh, don't overeat, uh, only overeat when you're in uh, company or whatever, because I'm sure that breaking all the rules and be, being in company and enjoying it, yeah. that uh, will, uh, uh, not if it's every day, but then you won't enjoy it that much for some reason. Uh, if something is an occasion, and then break all the rules, go ahead. But I say when you're gonna break the rules, instead of uh, uh, having a kit card behind the door, and, unless you enjoy that, go to Fauna and Nation or Patisserie Valerie or whatever. Go to the best uh, if you want to do that, but be sure that it's Cinderella time at midday, midnight. Uh, like on a Sunday, for example, and do that alternation. Yeah, we should explain as well to people listening is when we're talking about circadian rhythms, it's not just your circadian rhythm, it's your gut bacteria circadian rhythm. They have circadian rhythms too, don't they? That's why, that's why if you eat late at night, you don't sleep very well because they've not gone to sleep and they're not making things like melatonin to keep you asleep longer. Do you... um? You, you use off-label drugs? Sorry, can't hear you. Do you use off-label drugs? Uh, yeah, I use um, uh, repurposed drugs that I discovered in Vancouver in 1987 when I tracked the world before the computers and everything, after my father died, actually, uh, and I wanted to find out much more about what's going on. I dropped everything uh, that I had, went with a rucksack around the world, and uh, in Vancouver, there was um, a person uh, using, um, uh, was it indomethacin uh, together with tagamet, which is cemetidine, yeah. and others as well. And here also, I often notice that everywhere, um, uh, a vaccine that unfortunately was taken over the market uh, uh, with uh, lung, uh, against lung tuberculosis for in birds. Uh, so, there was this link between cancer that I'm still looking at with birds, uh, with uh, the lungs, tuberculosis, because that seemed to be here and there a recurrent theme. Um, and um, uh, unfortunately, that company, which was in Washington state, was bought up by another huge pharmaceutical company. And then the drug was uh, uh, quietly dropped, basically, uh, as it often happens. Well, um, it's a good point, actually, because tuberculosis, they use ECG vaccines, don't they? For yeah, tuberculosis. They and of course, that's used for bladder cancer. That actually yeah. does kill early bladder cancer. So there yeah. are there are uh, other uses, even oncologists, normal oncologists are using off-label drugs in a funny way. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, you know, I had these successes that I saw there in Vancouver, and I use already off-label drugs since 1987 basically it was not it was not called repurposed drugs then uh, that i remember uh, but uh, uh, the problem is that uh, there are so many studies on that already um, I, I personally wouldn't use it on its own it's um, when you have to have because it's a drug uh, and it has long term effects yeah uh, okay. so uh, I use it mainly uh, for people who come uh, and they needed some more help. The regime in the hospital didn't seem to entirely work as they planned to be. And then uh, uh, you can use the off-label drugs if they don't, if they I, are compatible with the drugs that they take. I think the I think the use of off-label drugs in Britain has become too rigid and we tend to be only using three or four. And, you know, already you and I have been talking about things outside the box. And I do think there are some outside the box. Professor Flavin and I were talking about the fact that the, the common four that care oncology use just aren't that good. And they're also not that applicable to brain tumours or breast cancer. You know, they, they use the same metformin, atorvastatin, um, mebendazole and... Um, Doxycycline. Would you ever use doxycycline on someone? Well, you have doxycycline, but it should be used together with vitamin C because it blocks the glucose. I yeah. use it 
but I must be very careful because after all, it is an antibiotic and yep. an antibiotic uh, kills over uh, good and the bad, so to speak, uh, in the gut. So uh, it depends what sort of stage or where they're at, uh, when it's someone you have nothing to lose sort of thing, uh, etc. But uh, you must be careful with these drugs. I don't prescribe for everyone. Uh, since the the book came out from excellent book from James McClelland, yeah. uh, uh, that was very well documented. But people seem to be fixated on one particular area of that book, and uh, they forget everybody else. So that I get patients who seem to be thinking that um, uh, you just have to take uh, these off labels and. Uh, uh, and they have a sort of misconception. Uh, I find it's a bit more than that. I find that she's kicked up a storm about pathways and these poor patients, I'm not, not belittling them, but most people just don't understand what a pathway is. And even if you went to care oncology, they're not talking about pathways. Care oncology aren't talking about pathways. And, and actually going after pathways is something very scientific. And mm -hmm. so people are really disturbed by the fact they can't, fix their pathway i think it's it's doing some people in the country a disservice you know they they feel frustrated stress because they don't know how to fix their pathway you you think that's well i agree that uh, people uh, make too much of a meal yeah uh, in the wrong sense themselves and uh, when i see people i generally try to be a helicopter as well as an ant on the floor, meaning uh, you have to look at the detail, but you have to look the overview. Yeah. And people uh, become too much of an ant, uh, uh, so to speak, and forget the whole picture. Uh, Jane McLennan doesn't do that, but uh, that's a consequence because uh, we, I think she tries to fix it uh, with uh, um, uh, a new book coming out. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I have great respect for her, yeah. uh, but uh, it's people, uh, this book is, is very scientific and uh, I think um, uh, you need people who guide, who should guide these people in a certain way and they want too passive, uh, this is a solution, uh, I take this and this drug and uh, my cancer will go away. Yeah. Sort of mentality, but and uh, I, I don't think it's ever like you, you're the same as me. We build programs. We don't. We yeah. don't. We don't throw one thing at somebody or three things at somebody. We build programs that go from A to Z, and and I think that's really how you beat cancer. I think building programs. Is, what about? We got a question from Richard Moore. He said, "What are your views on THC? What's your views on cannabis and cancer?" Well, first of all, it is illegal in this country. I know it doesn't sound boring. But as a medical doctor, if I say things and other doctors listen to this, obviously as well. So I have to rely on what the 16 or 20 states in America and Canada, Uruguay and Holland uh, are doing. Yeah. And it seems that uh, you have to have uh, one paper was talking about 25 cannabinoids, another paper about 40 cannabinoids, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, meaning all the substances in cannabis. Uh, what we're talking mainly here is CBD and THC and um, all the combination of it. And uh, some people said you have to have a combination of 50-50. Uh, uh, many people report that they feel anxious with 50-50. Uh, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, they should dilute that and have less THC. So again, we are at the beginning phases. I they see that is that uh, uh, it's good for some cancers. Which ones? I'm not entirely sure. Some talk about it's aggravating cancer. Uh, uh, I mean, the whole endocannabinoid system um, uh, has to be examined. It's an extremely important system in our body who is relatively young in science. Uh, it's a pity that governments all over the world have this sort of strange mentality of blocking uh, research, uh, just as I have blocked research in uh, psychedelics, basically. But that's another field. 
uh, not to do with cancer up to now. But uh, I think they should have uh, decent research. And I know anecdotally uh, that they have reported excellent results. Uh, but again, you have to be careful. Secondly, it's illegal in this country. So you never know what you're getting in your hands. I agree. I agree. What about, you mentioned Ruggiero earlier on. He, yeah. um, he, and a, I can't remember the other guy's name, Fadden or somebody in America, doctor. Um, they were talking about um, glycosamine glycans and chondroitin sulfate. Yeah, that's do you, right. Do you think that, I mean, you know, this was, this was taking bovine cartilage and the guy who did all the research actually was killing off tumours from brain tumours to goodness knows what. So do you think this is, I mean, there's just as much research on the web saying chondroitin sulfate causes cancer as, as beats it. Do you ever use it? I mean, is, what, what's your view? Yeah, I use that sometimes, uh, at obviously a huge price. Uh, after I read thoroughly the combination of vitamin D2, D3, chondroitin yep. sulfate, and uh, either oleic acid, uh, it's called redum, I think, and uh, uh, yep. phospholipid uh, that they use uh, in a an, in a subsequent uh, version as such. So uh, I read papers, as you say, about chondroitin sulfate and glucosamine, by the way, as well, uh, that seem to be anti-cancer and pro-cancer. So uh, yeah, it's it's difficult isn't it? because uh, phosphatidylcholine actually drives prostate cancer or can drive prostate cancer. It's a very important part of prostate cancer cells. So it's a, it's. I mean, it, there's this there's four and there's against it. All right, what about GC math? I'll let you off the hook. What about GC math? <laughs> well, it's not off the hook. Oh, no, it is brand new research. It's new research yeah. on GC math in the is last that? in the last year and a half. Yes. Right. And um, saying, saying everything we've always thought it did. It, you know, it, it blocks the things that, you know, cancer likes. Oh, well, I never used this map really, apart from uh, five years ago or 10 years ago or before well, it was. I, I had a patient in up. Japan, I had a patient, English patient in Japan, Tokyo, came to me. He was on, been put on GC map by his doctor, bog standard doctor. Right. Okay. But again, the same problem here. Where do you get the real GC map? Because they've been uh, wrong GC map around and yep. there's such controversial. They raided their offices in Guernsey or Jersey, I forgot, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, as such. So uh, I use it uh, as a combination and there were successes, yes. But uh, it's simply not available, as far as I can know, in this country. Okay, uh, I will let off the hook then. What about cancer stem cells? So let's let's dismiss doxycycline. What about resveratrol, um, genistin? Um, well, Dr. Dwight McKee. CG, lycopene, yeah. The Dr. Dwight McKee, uh, who was trained uh, as an oncologist, but before that, there was a strange... He worked with Ravici in New York and with Kelly on the metabolic typing. Uh, I know him personally well. Um, and he recently had a paper uh, I heard on the uh, Ralph Moss uh, report yep. uh, where he used, uh, instead of 25 or 26 or 30 uh, of these cancer stem cell uh, uh, type of products, anti-cancer stem cell yep. type of products, uh, he has um, uh, found that about six of them, or five, five of them, five, and the, uh, more with curcumin, with veritrol, uh, the, like a broccoli sprout type of thing, uh, green tea and genistein, and uh, uh, with or without fever few, that depends sometimes uh, another herb as well. But these are the ones, five that it's he good. used and had a paper on it. Uh, it's more than uh, a paper it's more than a paper it's it's i mean i've i've got an article like the top 10 cancer stem cell killers natural cancer stem cell killers but i mean he's gone into every piece of research on those top five 
Uh, they are, just for anybody's interest, they're EGCG from green tea, resveratrol, sulforaphanes, as you say, sprouting seeds, turmeric, and genistin. With genistin is often, you know, it's a phytoestrogen. It'll put your estrogens up is what my patients get told. And I always say, no, there, there's good estrogens and there's bad estrogens, and this is a good one. Um, but what's really interesting is they, there's a lady called Dr. Young S. Kim, and she's the head of cancer and nutrition at the National Cancer Institute. And those five are in her top nine compounds that prevent cancer recurrence. Right. So okay. why, would you, why would you do more than throw those at people? <laughs> That's a good question, because it doesn't always work. <laughs> uh, and that's why you look at other things and because of cancer including a cancer stem cell uh, has the capacity I'm sure of reversing back the role from as I said two or three million years ago and uses it mutation uh, in one way or another uh, that and uh, it seems many of these uh, uh, monsters hidden inside our genes some of some memory uh, that we have there seem to come about due to the what we postulate uh, the the stresses from this society, the pollution from this society, the what we do, uh, maybe viruses that were uh, well, absent. I can't remember who it was. It's a, it was some some tribe from way back who was saying the illness in one person is an illness of the whole tribe. Yeah, you could say that, or, or and you know, it's a bit like the sins of the father, etc. Yeah, uh, right. uh, do you use um, do you use amino acids? One lady asked, you "Use amino acids?" Amino acids. I have a tendency not to use it. The one that I use a lot is MAP, uh, Master Amino Acid Pattern, uh, because it's readily absorbed. Uh, uh, I have to take into account. Uh, uh, what we call the, the muscle wasting uh, that often happens with these people. And apart from saying uh, eat more protein and eat more carbohydrates one or two days a week consecutive, in certain cases uh, that I do, uh, there's an MAP. Uh, you let them exercise in the morning so that their muscles inflame, basically. Uh, they have to repair. They have no food in them. Uh, so uh, uh, they have no inflammation in their gut because any uh, digestion of food is inflammation. So uh, yeah. you have to reduce as well. So if you give the MAP at that moment, then they will repair the muscles uh, more likely from the physiology. You wait half an hour before you start eating your breakfast and hopefully your amino acids will be less going to the cancer and more going to your inflamed muscles uh, as such. But um, uh, I am not a fan of using uh, just uh, random, uh, not random. You can take uh, brain neurotransmitters and often they recommend uh, to take uh, taurine or to take uh, uh, tyrosine or uh, whatever uh, because we don't know exactly who does who. And no, this I'm whole sorry. controversy about glutamine, uh, whether it helps or not help, it's not just glutamine. You know, asparagine, betainin, probably yep. other. Well, yep. uh, we don't know. If anything, they recently read an article that uh, the cancers were seemingly low glucose was used, wasn't the cancer cells themselves, were the cells surrounding or in it, well, the immune cells and others, and the cancer cells themselves in that so called tumor that was highly consuming uh, glucose, the cancer cells were actually consuming glutamine uh, uh, overall. There was a recent article. Glutamine so or glutamate? <laughs> Careful. <laughs> glutamine, or, I, I, I did the same thing to uh, Thomas Seyfried. Glutamine or glutamate, be very careful. Glut Thomas Seyfried, yeah, the right. diet is trying to stop you eating glutamine. I said, Thomas, that's mad, I'm full of it. In my brain, in my muscles, et cetera, et cetera. And as every 19 year old school kid doing biology knows, glutamine is a non essential amino acid. You make it. You're trying to, you're trying to restrict glutamate, which is the fuel. 
and glutamine is converted to glutamate to mate by glutaminase. And lots of the things that kill cancer stem cells actually block glutaminase. What a coincidence. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. You well, mentioned one uh, last question. My article, my article actually mentioned glutamine, but I take your point that many researchers themselves are not aware of uh, the glutamine or glutamate. I agree. Which you made me aware as well quite a while ago. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> All right, here's your last question. And you talked about proteins, imbalances and so on earlier on. I have recently come across a lot of work in it's been, there's work in Germany, Israel, Japan on peptides. And there mm -hmm. was, of course, that man in America called Bozinski, who was putting missing peptides into people. What do you think about peptides? The future of cancer or... Just another gimmick. I have no uh, experience with that, apart from patients who were doing peptide, uh, there were two patients, uh, peptides uh, in, therapy. Uh, in therapy in Germany. Yes. It was, and uh, uh, neither of them survived. Uh, uh, and they had, I'm sure there's something, uh, Brzezinski, uh, that's more with the uh, urine and uh, everything else of yeah. that nature. I had a great success uh, with uh, Bozinski treatments for a brain cancer. I uh, was a boy of uh, 19 years old. He is now 25 or something. I uh, was uh, basically given up, didn't have any therapy before that, no radio, no nothing. Uh, had to do the whole uh, intravenous thing with peptides and uh, from Bozinski. Uh, it was a, quite an expensive operation, but their parents were willing uh, to do that. Uh, and after a few years, uh, was declared uh, cancer negative, went to university, and yep. had he been radiating and treatment at that time, he wouldn't. So with the Brzezinski peptides, I have experience with, and that works, uh, that can work, let's put it this way, with the peptides that you talk about in Germany, I have no experience with. Uh, for now. I, I think I was more making the point that suddenly you've got Germany looking at them. You've got Israel saying we can beat, there's some people in Israel say we can beat cancer using peptides. Basically for people who don't know, peptides are very short pieces of protein. And Brzezinski, if you like, started the whole ball rolling by saying, look, when people get cancer, they've got bits of peptide, bits of protein missing, so I can replace them. And he was hounded for years. Anyway, um, Right, I'm going to turn to you for one last bit. Um, we normally put people on the spot and say, have you got three tips for the people who are listening? What would you say most important to people who've got cancer based on what you do? Well, I would say in your daily life, without wasting time, do a form of uh, uh, intermittent fasting like uh, skipping breakfast is an easy answer. You and mean time restricted fasting? Yeah, time restricted <laughs> fasting. Uh, yeah, okay, time restricted fasting. Uh, basically, take your breakfast as late as possible and your dinner as early as possible, and your protein more at lunchtime. See what happens. If yep. you're in your turn it on, cold hall, cold hall, you know, etc. Alternate that. If you exercise. Do it uh, five minutes, three times a week, but until you're out of breath, you will get more mitochondria Absolutely. because your body will more of that. And uh, uh, also, uh, one evening per week, for example, um, skip altogether your food because your body will think there's a famine going on, uh, uh, and then uh, your DNA will start to get repaired. And if you do that once a week, all these things, uh, it doesn't cost if anything, less money because you eat less, uh, uh, then uh, you're doing yourself already a good favor uh, as such. So are you saying to bring yourself back into balance, you favor fasting? You favor doing the, the most success. But the thing is that most people either are too weak to do fasting when they come or 
are simply not willing to do it. And, uh, you know, supplements and all the rest. I, I mean, the most spectacular successes that I have seen uh, with uh, remissions, etc., was with fasting in a particular way as such. Uh, you know, alternate, and there's lots of studies on that and books appearing on it, etc. But that was already so, you know, when I started out doing all this, fasting was the way. Longo talks about, though, um, fasting not working as well if people have had drugs if people well, have drugs medicine which i never see people anymore unlike uh, 20 30 years ago uh, who have not had drugs so it yeah. becomes less yeah. possible yeah uh, like in the same way many therapies in the time of gerson uh, you know as you know uh, food even organic contains much less food uh, or vitamins and minerals and yeah. uh, nourishment and nourishments than they do now, than a hundred years ago, uh, et cetera. So we have to take that into account. And the air that you breathe and you know all the rest, Rachel yep. Cost, 1961, Silent Brain, et cetera, is uh, more, uh, more up to date than now, uh, than in 1961. The same story. All right, well, look, thank you for everything. It's been really great to have you on the show because we've covered so many different areas today from usual. How do people get hold of you, Etienne? How do people contact you? Well, uh, they can uh, get hold of me uh, via my secretary on uh, um, admin at drcalbot.com or on uh, 0303 230 uh, 2040. Okay, and I think, I think we've also got you on our website, so I'll make sure tomorrow okay. we've got your details on our website as well. All right, look, okay. let me just say thank you very, very much from everybody listening, and it's been a pleasure talking to you again. Okay, okay, let's, let's just leave it 16 years, okay, before we talk again. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right, all the best. Bye, Bye -bye. thank you.